Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is the Tech Report Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Drake. This is episode 177. I, I was typing that in tonight and I thought, holy cow, 177. When are, when are people going to catch on the fact that we're doing this and then beg us to stop? Um, this is the official podcast of the Tech Report at techreport.com, the number one place for news and reviews of the computer hardware world. I'm joined by Scott Wasson, Jeff Gager, and Jeff Campman. Uh, I'd ask them to introduce themselves, but they both sound so alike that does it really matter? Just they're like an amount of interchangeable bobbleheads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're just back and forth. Uh, we are live streaming the show as we've been doing here pretty regularly. If you haven't caught on to that, uh, yeah, then you haven't been listening. But you know, it's not my problem. We're over at twitch.tv slash the tech report. There's a, a good group of folks who are checking in on the comments. Um, mostly just I find generally the comments are like this side conversation. It's literally like the kids in the back aren't really listening. They're just kind of like, "Hey, what would you know? What, 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 you guys watching the uh, the game tonight? Yeah, they're they're doing pretty well. Are these guys doing a pot? No, we're not really paying attention. So you know, you guys just it's a side conversation. It's the back chatter. It's the back channel. It's good times. Um, before we talk about PC hardware, which is kind of what we do here on this show, um, it is my tradition that we start off with something that's not PC hardware, but that is usually near and gear near and gear near and dear to the geek heart. Uh, which lately has come in the form of a variety of TV shows and movies that are worth discussing. Let, let's let start. We'll go quickly here because I know we have a lot to discuss, but I, I do want the opinions. Let's start with the sort of billion-dollar headliner here, which is uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. I'm assuming if you've listened to this podcast, you've already seen it. Uh, a bunch of us have already seen it, and uh, it's been out for a while, so we're really late in talking about this, uh, but I don't care. So, Scott, uh, as the arbiter of taste on this show... What do you think that Jeff thinks about it? <laughs> I meant that Jeff is – I'm sorry. No. Anyway, Scott, what did you think of uh, Avengers Age of Ultron? I, did either Jeff see it? I no, of course not. I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah I think that gives <laughs> <Really>? you <laughs> – They're way too cool for that. So, yeah, yes. I, I enjoyed it. I had fun. I don't know that I liked it as much as the first one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it was packed full of a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. I, and everybody says that about it, and it's just true. And – you know, it felt like they had to do a lot of things to move things toward the next two movies. We know they're doing that. They're going to war with Thanos, right? Mm -hmm. And they yeah. had they brought in like a ton. They brought in new uh, superheroes into the Avengers. And it was there was a lot. There was a big agenda other than just like telling the story, right? Um, and so there was a lot going on. And. I would have liked it to be a little smaller and more intimate and have more time for interaction between, you know, mm -hmm. some of the leads and, and some of that stuff. But I enjoyed it. I thought the, the really interesting thing, Jordan, was it was very comic booky in terms of the action. Um, mm. Like they did a good job of capturing that feel from some of the illustrations of the old Marvel comic books. As much as I've seen them, I don't have, I'm not a huge comic book guy, but, but they had that kind of kinetic feel like a comic book. Um, so it didn't feel like a really consequential action. Everything was kind of made up rubber, you know, it bounced off and nobody gets hurt. There's no blood, but, um, but it was, there was a lot going on and it had that very, uh, more than Almost any comic book movie, anything in this series, any of the Iron Mans or, or Captain America's, any of the other things that they've done, it had that feel. And um, it was fun. I yeah. mean, I, I thought that part of it was interesting. And, and the fact that I'm commenting on, like, the sort of kinetic vibe of it gives you some idea about what's on the screen. There's a lot of that, right? I think it's one of those films, too, and I, I find we, 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 we are in this age of Marvel movies where it now is the case that – there are no um, Daredevils. I don't mean the TV show. I mean the movies. There are no Catwomans in the Marvel. I can't speak for the DC side. That's that's TBD as far as Batman versus Superman is concerned. But there are really no duds. In, and really there are no bad films. You could argue some of the Thor films haven't hit as well. But in general, these are good films, well-directed, well-acted, with characters that are very true to their comic book origins. You know, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is Tony Stark. Chris Evans is Captain America. Mark Ruffalo is the best Hulk we've had thus far. So... You get to the point now, and then you've got Joss Whedon at the helm, and he did an excellent job with the first Avengers. Has a does I would say better job than than many many other people could at balancing all these different characters. So when people are quibbling about, you know, sort of these minor nuances, it's sort of like, eh, you know, it could have been a five star, but it was just a four star for me. I could be, excuse me, I don't mean to be putting words in your mouth, Scott, but I do feel like we're in this 
we're in this luxury of riches, uh, the embarrassment of riches, I should say, when it comes to quality, high quality entertainment from Marvel. We'll talk about Daredevil in a second where, you know, we're nitpicking, but overall, this is such a, such a, as, as far as ensemble movies go, it's such a more high quality production and done so much better than things have ever been done before. It's to me very satisfying to watch, very enjoyable, and something that I will always want to rewatch at some point. Let's watch this action sequence as I have with the Avengers. Um, so it's a it's kind of a wonderful thing. I don't know if the, how long they can keep it up, but that seems to be the age that we're in right now. Yeah, they haven't. I mean, just because maybe this one wasn't as great as the last one in some ways. Some of it is because the last one didn't have the expectations that this yes this, yes that, that, helps. that that one created. This one had to deal with right um yeah. doesn't mean this was bad it wasn't bad um i think that what i'm a joss whedon fan from way back right i'm like, like yep. seven seasons of buffy and i i even watched dollhouse some and like i tried <laughs> you know um, yeah it was a little hard and, and, and all that stuff and, and i wanted to, to see him do what he does best and instead we got uh well, it was kind of a low risk corporate product in the sense that they had to service the franchise they had to have all the different characters in it, it was still in a lot of ways a wonderful thing um but it maybe wasn't what i would have like wanted exactly if it were me right there and was there was definitely some press exposure post the movie from whedon saying that that was his conflict was trying to yeah keep the executives happy with all the things they knew were going to sell tickets and him wanting to add in some of the more nuanced storylines, some of the more intimate moments that are hard to do. I, I, I kind of felt like, you know, the, the whole farmhouse sequence with Hawkeye and his family and, you know, people complained that it was a slow part of the movie. I didn't think it was rushed. I thought it was an appropriate little look at, at, at the realism of a particular character as a way of sort of showing the rest of their, the fact that they have real lives or they all want to or that's something they're they're after so i you know i agree that there was a lot of show but at the same time it wasn't you know it wasn't a, in the transformers league where it's like there is nothing going on here except for the action so yeah you know yeah, yeah. you have to sort of tip of the hat for what he was able to accomplish despite i'm sure a lot of limitations and of course this is the problem that a lot of directors had with marvel is they always want to insert other storylines for future films because they're trying to keep this continuous universe yeah. So um, anyway, yeah, no, certainly not as good as Avengers one uh, had its issues. I enjoyed myself. I think you did as well. Um, and uh, Jeff and uh, Jeff will torrent. I mean, will rent. I mean, will uh, red. Um, will I don't know what they'll do. I uh, maybe there's a a sheet somewhere in Vancouver they can buy a rip off of. But um, never watch it. Maybe maybe just never watch it. Yeah. But, but apparently Daredevil is is in the play queue playlist uh, queue from from Netflix for some of us. Show of hands. I know I've watched it. Scott sounds like you have. Jeff Gager, Jeff Campman, are you in the dark on this one? Or are you along with the uh, the devil, as I like to say? I have not watched it. I've heard, okay. I've heard you good suck. things. So, yeah. um, no, I'm kidding. So, uh, yeah, this is interesting. I mean, the first are, is this the first superhero TV show? And I'm sorry, I really dislike the CW stuff. So, people who are big Archer and um, Flash fans, um, you know. That's nice for you. Uh, this is this is some of the best TV we've seen for comic book f franchises ever. No, I think it's the best TV series ever. I there are Ooh, a few seasons of TV that I really have appreciated. Like, have you have you ever seen season one of Veronica Mars? Um, um, Mystery. I have not. I'm aware that it was quite quite well well known. Well done. Oh, excuse me. Archer is a wonderful show. Arrow Arrow is the one I meant. I'm yeah. yeah okay. Lambast in the comments. Continue, um, please. But that, that show, season one, was written uh, beginning to end before they started filming, which is not how TV is usually done. It was mm -hmm. a, a season-long story arc mystery, and so right. it was really good. This was also written completely before they started filming. 13 episodes on Netflix, released right. at the same time. And it's, it's 13 chapters in a really long movie, a 13-hour movie, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and they know exactly what they're doing and where they're going from beginning to end. And they combined like incredible casting with this really smart approach to doing TV because they don't have a huge budget and they have to do a comic book movie, right? So right. they did this really stylistic kind of thematic, everything's dark. It's kind of gritty feeling thing. But then the whole series is maybe four people max usually, but usually two or three people on scene to or on screen together at once for these scenes that are sometimes fairly long with just exceptionally well-written dialogue 
really right. well cast, great actors, and they're telling the story. And right. they're not doing a ton of CG. There's, they're, they're not doing a ton of action, but they're setting things up. And when the action happens, you know why you care about it. You know what's at stake. And for the action, they just went with all practical effects with yep. a really great stunt team who was like just awesome with martial arts and they were inspired by kung fu movies and, and you you could see like right out of hong kong a lot of these yeah. fights are are straight up inspired by that but they're exceptionally well done and then they've done some really cool things with cinematography like at the end of episode two this camera on a crane going down the hallway the hallway fight is already is being talked about already is one of the greatest things that, that has been done of that type and I, Jordan, I could not tell you anything I've enjoyed more than, than what they did. Have you finished the whole first season? Yeah, yeah, and I, I may watch it a second time because I, I just wow. think it's fantastic. And, and the guy who plays the the kingpin, they don't use that name for him, uh, his portrayal, uh, Vincent, Vincent D'Onofrio, yeah. of, of this sort of man-child with this physical menace and this, this rage because he's just still a like stunted development is is fascinating and chilling and he's sympathetic yet horrible and, and um you know the whole thing is just really well done and, and like rosario dawson plays is in this thing she should have like oscars and, and i mean she's a great actress and she's wow. just like scott watson she, no, she really is she's a great actress and she's just a like she's not even in every episode they don't they don't overuse her um and everybody i thought i thought all the cast was really well done um or really well chosen so anyway yeah raves i don't have anything bad to say i just wow I keep not talking at all about good but you know good writing good dialogue good sure. acting uh filmed kind of like a play uh where, where you have people interacting it doesn't get much better than that in terms of i thought the you know problems. speaking of the play i thought the musical breaks were exceptional <laughs> jeff gay <laughs> jeff gager um the devil on my shoulder scene i thought was particularly good um Jeff Gazer, what did you think of the show? Uh, I see. I've read a bunch of the the old comic, kind of a little bit, you know, worried about this. But I think for me, the best thing about it is it really nails the tone of the comic book. It doesn't has a very different tone than a lot of the superhero books, just like Daredevil kind of did. And there's this kind of struggle that I don't think you see a lot in this kind of content, and I think gives it a little everything a little bit more gravity sequences are incredibly well choreographed but there's this kind of um, that's that's maybe because it's not you know super high budget with all these crazy wire stuff and you know explosions going off but there's like an intimacy and and kind of brutality to it. but you know your your main character getting the crap beaten out of him as well which you don't see a lot of in the superhero movies is like a list of superheroes yeah it's not it's not you couldn't put that on network tv it's very much Netflix no. making a statement. There's not a lot of, uh, there's a little language. There's not a lot of sex, but there's a lot of violence and it right. is dark yeah. in that like, way. It's a lot like this podcast. That's kind of how yeah, I describe you know, it. A, a little bit of language, of, not a lot of sex, blood lots and, of violence. Yeah. But when, when Kingpin like decapitates a guy with the, with the door, I let me just <laughs> take this as an opportunity to say, it is fascinating to me. The people that I've heard talk about this show and I have seen the whole season, you are all referencing sequences from the first half of the season. Because I would submit to you that the first half of the season is a fantastic TV show, and the second half of the season, to me, was boring as wow. all get out. And I say that, I think, for two reasons. A, because I'm very critical and, and kind, of a, kind, kind of a dick. And secondly, because I live in New York City, and they keep talking about Hell's Kitchen mm -hmm. and wanting to save Hell's Kitchen, and have you guys ever been to Hell's Kitchen? Hell's Kitchen is like the is like small. I'm trying to think of the best best description I can give of it. It's it's full of restaurants and it's where a lot of like it's right on the edge of where all the Broadway movie theaters are. There is nothing like Brooklyn or Bronx or Queens or like there's a few projects in Hell's Kitchen, but it's like they keep talking about it like they're trying to save this small town. And Hell's Kitchen is like there's big office buildings and it's it there's nothing romantic at all about Hell's Kitchen and they're the Deborah Ann Wool character is so emotional about all these characters living in this part of the city and I'm sorry again I think this is because I happen just to live here who is part of the city where you have like theater techs and and people who work in the restaurant row there on 42nd Street and like it Hell's Kitchen is not 
like this neighborhood that's like worth saving. So I see them being really emotional and they're getting really all hopped up and they're trying to save their city. And I'm like, it's like you're trying to save Times Square. Like we're going to take back Times Square. It's like it just so so again, this is maybe where my my geogra geography is, is affecting my um, yeah, someone said in the comments it's called Midtown West. Very true. But anyway, the point is, is I, I, it really threw me because they were so focused on saving this part of the city that no one really gives a crap about at all. And again, I know that's something that is specific to, to my experience. But then I also just felt like, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe maybe everyone else felt differently. I just felt like all the drama was, to me, the ultimate reason of why you can't make a great superhero TV show is that it's not The Wire. It's not S.H.I.E.L.D. There's no actual problems it's just these this sort of drama made up of a hypothetical vigilante situation and trying to take down these corporations that makes for a much better historical drama like you know th three days of the condor or the all the president's men than it really does is like superheroes kicking butt i just that 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 was a disconnect for me so overall very impressed with the show for the first half of it but then it just turned into a lot of emotional overtures and people crying over like old ladies getting hurt and then saving a part of the city that's now essentially just a bunch of row apartments and restaurants and theaters, and then it was over. Is that no? Oh wow! Tell that me was, how you really feel, George. Yeah, that's. that's <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, you do know that it's there's a comic book source where they use Hell's Kitchen as the setting, and it's very much I a do. fictitious. I do. It's not really where you live it's... i know but i can't help myself <laughs> i mean i'm it's, just you know making it's, you know, sure like yourself <laughs> with acid jordan <laughs> it, it's like this it's like it's like hell's kitchen is the kind of place in new york city and I, is where people go hey we're all going out to dinner where in hell's kitchen oh god hell's kitchen um look i got plans tonight i i really you you go you have fun i'm gonna Go home and eat some Chipotle. Speaking of which, this episode is brought to you by Chipotle. I have some here. I'll be eating it later in the show, but that's that's coming. Don't don't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, we don't really have a sponsor because wow. But yeah. sorry, and I, again, I think that's very to specific to my experience. Chipotle, but later. take away the Hell's Kitchen part. Did you guys not really feel that like a lot of that drama was really just? It was like someone was pumping it with a bike pump. We got to make this as dramatic and as 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 dangerous as possible. But it to me didn't really land as like something really bad. It was like essentially it was gentrification. Oh, they're buying out old people in their homes, and it's like that could happen with imminent domain, like tomorrow, because like you know your, your local county decides they want to turn your house into a strip mall. Like you yeah, know what I'm saying? I, I heard that criticism from some other people. I, I think the problem that the, they had was they wanted they, they they took this turn and this is spoilers so don't listen if you know whatever but they took this turn where there was some moral ambiguity about the hero versus the bad guy right and the thing is that you you're supposed to have the background to understand the bad guy is really the bad guy still and he was really the hero still but mm -hmm. they didn't necessarily have enough reminders of why the bad guy is bad and right. why that's a problem. And so they, they had this rising tension because they had already done all the setup and it was time for basically the conflict between, you know, the big bad and the, the hero. And the, they were then working out this whole, like, will this work or will the bad guys play to kind of win over the public, you know, help like him move the pieces to where he's victorious and yeah like the stake setting there wasn't as good as it should have been they should have had one or two more clear scenes where like you understood all right this this guy really is bad and there would be a bad outcome if, if i may very yeah. quickly at the beginning of the show it was human trafficking and that was perfect because i was like yes you've got people being you know carted right. away in shipping containers and sex trafficking and it was like all the real stuff that's happening in the world now where it's like you get this kingpin character and he's overseeing this empire that involves human trafficking and i'm thinking okay that's great like let's take those guys down and then it just slowly turned into let's put a Starbucks in the corner and I'm going to finance it and, and we're going to move the money around so you won't know it's me doing it. And that, that's where I was like, you know, had a, had, a, had a challenge. Yeah, they didn't have enough negative consequences there. But you know what? I, it worked for me anyway because I understood, like, because I watched it all in a very short period of time. Yeah, that helps. I, I understood, like, this was still the guy who did all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah I get that. And um, so it didn't bother me that much. Anyway, we, 
we've yeah, got we'll move on. We'll move on. We got a lot. We got a lot to, talk, got about, a lot to so. talk about. So, Mad Max. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so. <laughs> Welcome to the TV show and movie review podcast posted by the Tech Report. So Corsair lets the bulldog out is our first story. Now, are we going to start? Help me, help me understand, guys, because as you know, I, 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 my character on this show is I'm sort of like a Stephen Colbert. I'm just mostly ignorant, and I pretend that's an act. Um, so. Are we going to start off with some some Computex? What where where are we going with this? What's the all the news that happened in the PC hardware world this this week was Computex related? Right. Uh, right. Everybody does a bit of new. All the big companies, the Microsofts and the Intel's, everybody does stuff, and it's related to Computex. So I think everything that we have here can fit under the category Computex. Excellent. I, well, unfortunately, none of us were in Taipei. I should have been there, but I just right. Have a lot going on, and it didn't well, you're happen. watching Daredevil. I get it. I mean, yeah, you know, I was going yeah. for a few laps. It's fine, <laughs> and they'll have good Wi-Fi on the international planes, so it's like, eh, you know, Computex, Daredevil. I get it. You know, yeah, you gotta do what you got to do. Corsair releasing the case they're calling the Bulldog. It's a bare bones mini ITX rig. It looks actually kind of cool. I'm impressed. You know, it's funny that we we're still talking about PC hardware, and people have been iterating and designing for a long time, and someone comes out with something that I don't know. I, I I don't hate. Yeah, Moving on. Um, no. There on the aesthetics. It's, yeah. You know, I think it, it looks cool, but the thing is, it's supposed to be a living room gaming PC, and it doesn't mm. look like it would fit in my living room. Oh, I yeah. see. Which is, you know, I you appreciate that mission the design, but, you know, you combine kind of these extreme lines with a bunch of venting and then this red trim that I don't know. That look like that. I mean, maybe like a man cave or something, or maybe people with way more, more style lenses that look like that. But it just—it's kind of a weird living room looking case. It's very, you know, I think, or at least that's how it comes across to me. Yeah, okay. but it's an idea. The the concept here you don't see a lot of, which is a, a company like Corsair that makes cases and coolers and things, putting it all together into a bundle, and you right, put in right. some stuff. Um, and, and I mean, it's kind of bare bones all put together, but you know, they should do that with other size systems for people who want to do, you know, d build DIY systems. I think I like that idea. And I think it makes sense to do that for a living room system where you need to have, like, they've got water cooling. It's really compact. Yeah. Pre pre-designed like this little closed loop water cooling radio. Yeah. That's kind of cool. And, and so the concept is great. The execution the what they chose with the aesthetics is really gonna be divisive i think just because it's very like it's i don't know everybody's gonna build something that is a combination of the stealth fighter and the 1985 <laughs> bw gti and it's gonna be it's gonna be angular it's gonna be black it's gonna have red accents and whatever this is the most controversial instantiation of those two things together i'm sure it has a small radar signature where are you getting the gti 1985 Volkswagen rabbit GTI i'm looking at was, it was i'm looking at it black with, right, red, with red trim, trim. It was the trim. car that did that first, as far as I know. And right. the the stealth fighter, the the first one. Oh, I am very familiar out. with. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Everything is made, basically is built to look <clears throat> like like a combination of those two things or one of the two. And I don't know, man. I I wouldn't put that in my living room at all. Like even well, if know, that was the easiest, best way to build a, a system that size, I'd be like, no. <laughs> so you know, I it's know. interesting because in the in our chat room, Floto makes the comment that he thinks it probably has a small radar signature, and that's the observation I was going to make. Is that you know I'm I'm famous on this podcast for saying I'm famous for a lot of other things, but I'm famous on this podcast for saying um, that you know the point of a PC hardware case or excuse me a PC case if you're going to build your own is to attract women, and the 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 radar signature of might escape their notice like they're they might bounce right off and not even realize there's a pc case there and that's kind of what you have a living room pc for you know is to get the women to, to um i'm gonna stop so um <laughs> yeah, it's gonna my wife would you. take one look at that and wouldn't even care if it's a pc she's just like you're not putting that in the list yeah the I'm wife acceptance factor See, Jeff, you have the low. opposite problem than yeah. what i'm describing but that's you know yeah I guess that makes sense. Uh, laptop brings keyboard to the mouse and couch. Jeff, this is your story. More from Corsair. Um, this looks even to me more retro. Like this looks like something I would have seen in like a like a 1996 issue of like PC Magazine. Like a, a really cool new futuristic laptop, or excuse me, a keyboard slash mouse combo. 
I like this. This is I actually want one of these. Yeah. It's, it, the basic premise is that it's it's sort of a, a laptop tray for a keyboard and mouse. It's you can buy it with, with a keyboard or one that'll fit any of Corsair's ten keyless vengeance units. And hmm. the idea is it's basically just a wireless lap station if you want to do sort of FPS or, or RTS or I guess MOBA games or any game keyboard and mouse that you want to play on a home theater PC without kind of sacrificing the control and, and sort of dumbing things down using a controller. Uh, so it's totally wired. It has an integrated USB uh, hub. And yeah, it's, it's basically an extension for your, your keyboard and mouse for home theater PC. So I think it looks great. The, unlike, I think Rocat has a, a similar model that's, that's all basically built around a keyboard. So it's this sort of keyboard with a giant mousing surface attached. I think I've, this is a little bit better, I think, because it's modular. You can actually replace the keyboard that's in it. Um, so hmm. yeah, I think this is, it's kind of tied to Together it is also available separately. I think if you buy it empty without a, a keyboard, it's going to be eighty nine dollars, and it's going to be one hundred and ninety nine with one of their RGB uh, mechanical keyboards included. So what you're saying is if the if the computer case doesn't get the ladies, hit them with this because this this is sure to. <laughs> and it's 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 so like gaming focused that yeah. they don't even have like they have a they they expect you to use a wired mouse. Yeah, um, that's commitment, man. I that is. N not gonna that's happen the part of this that seems the most house. retro to me is that little is that little stick that's sticking up above it's got a mouse bungee yeah awesome. yeah because i'm like oh i'm sorry you know what you know what the reason why this is such a throwback for me is i have this visual in my head of growing up we had this mouse pad that was thick it was like yay thick and then it had that little spiral curly bungee at the, bungee. at the back of it that kept your mouse cable you know up and through so you could you know navigate on this circular dish is like yay big and uh, we had that for years. This kind of reminds me of that. It's like a 19, you know, it's a 1998 accessory. Yeah. Um, this time. is also like the kind of like the Phantom lap board, which has been around for, you remember the Phantom console that never took off? <laughs> they, no. built the, they still sell that lap board thing that, that's kind of a, anyway. I, I don't know. Let's talk about what you might really use for gaming in the living room. Absolutely, and that is the Valve Steam Controller. Now, this is interesting to me because I, Steam boxes are available for sale now. Yes? No. No. Why did I think they were? Okay, so just the I, controller is available. Well, you can build your well, own Steam box yeah, by putting, yeah. you know, big picture mode on any PC and hooking right. it up to your television. We're way but past then, the first launch date and the second launch date, and we're into right. the third launch date. But the fourth launch date—I don't know how many launch dates there have been—but the next launch date is before Christmas, and right. they actually are taking pre-orders on two things now. Which is, and and the Steam controller is one of them. The Steam controller and Steam Link, 50, which is a, they're both fifty bucks. The Link is a little right. like when you do stream in home Steam Steam in home streaming. About to mm -hmm. got that completely backward. Uh, then it can be a client for that that you can hook up to your TV. Yeah. And then the controller is the little dual rounded touch pads plus yeah. other magic stuff. That the hope is that will let you take a keyboard mouse oriented PC game and using your thumbs with this controller and some magical mapping actually control a game from the couch in a precise way um, that will make it all work. So I don't and know. Has guys, anyone on this team ever used the, the latest iteration? I know there was one that they updated, but Cyril have... used an early one. He said that it has a pretty big uh, learning curve. He, he rests in peace. What? Um, but I don't know. I ordered this. It's they're supposed to have early. I think I got I, like immediately when they opened orders. I ordered one of these. Uh, so I think I'll hopefully have one of the first batch in October. The rest ship in like November sometime. Mm -hmm. So I hope I'll have one and we can review it. Um, I'm really fascinated because the whole Steam box, con box concept to me kind of is predicated on this working because I doubt yeah. that lots yeah. of people will have the lap board lap dog thing from Corsair in their living rooms. Um, you need something. That's a control scheme, and uh, this is this is the attempt. So, Jeff, you said you're going to mm. order two. Did you order them yet? No, I have. Well, I'm going to wait for you to review it first. Okay. Yeah. I I don't know. I that's what I was going to. I was like, if this works, I want four. But I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. It is it is there a I trigger a with this motion here? <laughs> where you? I'm looking at the video. It's like there's actually a trigger down by your palm and your fingers. Yeah, there's uh, yeah. supposed to be a grip trigger on it. They call it, I think. Huh. Well, I like the in dual addition stage to the regular triggers trigger. for the main ones too. Yeah, right. There's like a an analog pull in and then a digital click at the end as well. So, and they have mappings that you can download. It'll be like cloud based community upload 
like you can create a mapping for a game for the controller and then mm -hmm. download. I, I got to think that's really important for older games and stuff like that. And then my other hope is that like somebody like the community somehow settles on a, like a standard mapping that works, you know, that, that really people can adapt to. Cause I, I look at that thing and I think about what I want to do and man, there's a lot of complexity in that. I just, I'm, I don't know. Moving on, Cherry Trail System on a Chip anchors new Transformer convertible. Jeff, Jeff, this is your story and really something you should cover, I think, because you've been the Transformer, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Transformer King, so to speak, on this. Fanboy. On this, <laughs> fan, fanboy. <laughs> well, Jeff, we're reviewers, we're journalists, my, my friend. We can't be fanboys. Um, oh, you can be a fanboy of a good idea. Oh, that's what you say. Uh,. Tell us about this latest version of the Transformer. This is the, which one is this? The T100 the T100 HA? The T100 HA, yeah. Right. So this replaces the old T100, which is kind of your $400, 10.1-inch, you know, atom-based uh, Windows 8 convertible. This is the new version that's based on Cherry Trail, which is a successor to Bay Trail. Uh, it's built on 14 nanometer tech. It has uh, new, more powerful integrated graphics, but it's sort of a, the same class of processor, roughly, as the, the old Bay, tra Bay Trail quad-core chips. Uh, and this is kind of the same class of system as the old Transformer. It still has a 10-inch screen. Um, you don't get a high PPI option. It's it's 1280 by 800, which is a at least a slightly more squarish aspect ratio than the old uh, 1366 by 768. Uh, they've all also given it a Type C USB 3.1 port, and it looks like the the docking station on this is a little bit better than the one that we talked about uh, on the last podcast in the Transformer book, uh, the T300G. Uh, so this one does have the magnetic connection, but instead of connecting via Bluetooth, it's got some sort of wired connection as well. So it should sort of behave more like an actual clamshell system on the tour link um, instead of behaving kind of like a, a tablet plus Bluetooth keyboard, which is what you get with the Qi. Uh, so it is, this is kind of a lower end system. I don't have pricing for this yet, but I would expect this to be in sort of the $400 and under range, probably actually cheaper because Asus does have a, uh, I think it's the T100 Qi, uses sort of a similar quad core atom chip, but has a, a fancier 1900 by 1200 display and, you know, like a fancier aluminum body and stuff. And that starts at $400, so this could be kind of down in the $300 range or maybe even cheaper. Uh, so this is coming. This is going to come out with Windows 10 as well. So it's not going to come out until sort of midsummer when the OS is ready for release. Uh, hmm. Look at that green. Actually, Q3 is when it's coming out. Sorry. It's minty. Check that out. Yeah, they got some weird colors on this. I mean, I like that they're doing different colors, and it looks like this kind of has a matte surface. Um, and yeah, it's sort of a different different color palette this time. So, so they, it looks like a good system for, you know, students or people who want a cheap, um, you know, cheap cheap machine that sort of covers the basics, also can be a tablet and has long battery life. Um, so more of the same. Yeah, more of the same. Um, not sort of the most exciting system in the world, but I think they sold a lot of the T100, so I imagine they're going to move a lot of these as well if the price is right. Yep. So the next one, I want to talk about this. The ZenPad. ZenPad S tablet. Type-C yes. USB, that's upon us. Type-C USB and kind of a big change in the aspect ratio department. Most Android tablets either have a 16 by 10 or a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. This one goes uh, 4 by 3. It has the same aspect ratio, screen size, and resolution as the, the iPad Mini 3. Um, so and it and basically uh, it looks like a competitor for that tablet. Uh, it's based on a Morfield chip, which is the the same chip we had in Dell's Venue Eight Seven Thousand tablet that we reviewed a, a little while ago, that ultra thin one. Uh, and this one looks pretty thin too. Looks like it has a nice screen, has a Type C connector. Uh, this comes with a Lollipop version of Android with Asus's own skin on it. Um, so it's it's I'm interested to see how this catches on. It does look like a uh, Asus's take on kind of a more premium Android slate. Asus needs to get a clue from NVIDIA and Dell and the Nexus program and stop scanning Android. <laughs> like, they're, they're so close to having the best stuff in, in some of these categories. And then they scan it and it gets worse instead of better. 
And and it's kind of like then there's this little it's a stopper, right? If I'm like, oh, I want to buy that, and then it's like, nah, I don't know, I like I need to see what that weirdo skin does to a lollipop, right? And then mm -hmm. it, you know what it does to a lollipop, which is the next time a new OS comes out, they're gonna have to skin it before they release uh, a new version. So when it makes updates slower, and, and like that's not okay, right? I mean, I, it's not okay to make make Google's OS worse for your branding and then make your users have to wait longer for much bigger improvements that Google's making to its OS than the ones that the changes that you made so that you can like mess up the new one. I, anyway, this is an old, this is an old discussion, but yeah. uh, like I really, these things, this is just personal for me because these things appeal to me. Like I, I would like, I like the fact that they made, they did the wider aspect. Um, the more field stuff has been good. The Zen phone is nice, uh, Zen phone two, and this is appealing, but, uh, I, I wish the skin weren't, weren't there. So there you have it. Hmm. So unlock the bootloader and offer, you know, if you want to start messing around and add your own operating system, there may, may be options for that. I think Asus has been a little bit better than some other manufacturers on, on doing unlock bootloaders, but. I, that sounds like that sounds that like a setup for kind of a level of tinkering that you probably don't want to bother with on a tablet. I'm too lazy to fix their stuff. Like just don't <laughs> break it. Anyway, that's me. But brand, I, I don't know. I think I think installing your own operating system sounds like just a great setup for a crash-free experience. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I put a nice capper on that one. Uh, Windows 10 set for July 29th release. Holy cow, it's almost here. Mark your calendars. Is this going to be the one that's free? Yes. Yeah. For, for some Windows owners, but most Windows right. owners. Right. What are the big advantages at this point? I've, I've lost track. <clears throat> well, of, of 10? What, DX12? Is that kind of it? That's one of them. Uh, Start menu... The start menu becomes the back. the home screen, and yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Isn't that terrible? I don't feel like Microsoft. Everybody's kind of like, well, this one looks pretty good, but then the feature set isn't something that well, they got the the virtual desktops. They've got the continuum stuff between multiple devices. It right. mostly it seems to be like fixing the tablet overreaching of Windows eight on the desktop and kind of dialing that back. And then putting more smarts in for two and one devices for sort of being in the right mode, depending on whether or not you've got a keyboard attached or, or something like that. So it does seem to be mostly a, a point release of fixing stuff that they went too far with. So I won't see tap here to choose what to do with this device on my 30 inch <laughs> desktop PV monitor. No touch. You may still see that occasionally. Oh, <laughs> this is the worst thing ever, man. I mean, um, I think the biggest improvements for this are going to be on mobile devices. Like, a lot of the demonstrations they show have been, like, big things for mobile, like tablets and phones becoming flexible, becoming more like desktops in certain modes when they're connected to certain monitors or displays. Mm -hmm. And then the desktop experience is just going to be more like the desktop experience. You yeah. Know, we know and love. So. Hey, hey, Jeff, did you get your, your notification yet about the upgrade? I did. I have reserved my res I have reserved my upgrade. Yeah, so that's the other that's the other thing about this is it's a free upgrade, but already Microsoft is using this like for your device, which they mean system. They use the word device. Um, right. So if you have Windows Seven, Windows Eight, Eight Point One, then you get a free upgrade for your device, and they've got the little system tray notifications going out everywhere now, um, and, and you can like reserve it now, but I think you get like a whole year to where you can get them. Um, but this is the other issue then, uh, what happens if you want to reinstall? And so the answer is, I guess that they will allow a clean reinstall. Hmm. This is Bruno's story of, right. of Windows 10. And, and so guys, is that enough? Is that good enough for you that you feel like, okay, this is a good deal or? Yeah, I mean, I'm perfectly happy already. Like if they're just handing out a free operating system upgrade and it's better, which, you know, we hope it is, but, mm -hmm. you know, then they say you're not like restricted to this somehow, like you have to have the upgraded copy. I mean, great. But 
like there's there is something a little bit ominous about this post like they say you don't need your old windows product key mm-hmm. so i'm wondering i think i've read this somewhere but i can't like cite a source you know like they're they're making a hash or something based on your hardware that you know that's what they're licensing it with and i don't know like what effects or implications this will have like if you upgrade your cpu or graphics card or whatever or motherboard but then that's always required like maybe a call to microsoft anyway so well you go through you go through this terrible process now where if you do enough hardware changes to trigger you need to reactivate and you've activated too many times then you have to call this phone number and you have to type into the phone this long set of strings of like 10 five character strings just so and then they're going they read back to you this this equally long set of letters and numbers or whatever that you have to type in to get activated again and mm-hmm. um it kind of stinks and, and i don't know how that would fit with a you, that's not for a clean install although i guess you could probably do the install and then activate later but you know, right I, I i think the 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 thing that the system builders are worried about is what if i have a, a copy of windows 8 or windows 7 that i can take to whatever system i want and i have that right now and i know sort of how that looks and then i get the windows 10 upgrade and i build a new system and i do i have to buy a new version of windows and the right. answer to that is never super clear you're usually not super clear because microsoft isn't really enthusiastic about uh not making you buy another copy they usually kind of do the right thing but I don't they know. Just make you jump through a few hoops to to do that. I think That's... right. And if you're uncomfortable and maybe decide to buy a copy instead, like they're okay with that. <laughs> sure. That's the thing. I've never heard of somebody being denied a request to you know have another activation under any circumstance. Um. So. Yeah. If you go through that process. Like usually it works and if it doesn't then i think you talk to somebody and they usually grant your request so yeah i mean if you're a legitimate customer and you pretty much know it i I don't know i think think i read somewhere too it's something about if the this it's still one system that you're doing as long as you're replacing a previous system with a system as opposed to having sort of an active previous license on another machine then that's kind of what their threshold is um, so yeah, hopefully that continues and we don't have too many shenanigans. Yeah. I just like shenanigans, particularly shenanigans by Microsoft. Speaking of shenanigans from Antec, they released a new case. Jeff Camp, and this is your story. It's the signature S10. I remember the signature cases like that line has been around for a long time. I'm trying to vaguely remember some of their earlier models. This is a pretty interesting looking case. Yeah, it's, um, it's a full tower. To- yeah, it's a it's a like all new full tower design. It's supposed to represent um, a new design direction for them. Um, you know, it's it's so it features like this triple chamber setup where like the motherboard is off in one box and the storage is off in another box in the front of the case, and then the power supply and more SSDs are you know in their own little thing. Um, I guess that's supposed to be the innovative part of it. Um, like we've seen this before with some dual chamber cases from Corsair, for example, their Carbide Air Series 240 splits storage and the motherboard off into separate things, but this is just like a step further. So everything gets its own cooling air. Um, so, and like, this is like, it's supposed to be a premium case. Like, the suggested price is 500 bucks, which is insane for a case it's like one of the more expensive cases on the market if not the most expensive but like the entire exterior is supposed to be aluminum i think and the doors you know like they're aluminum and they're said to be offering like a tempered glass option instead of like plastic which is what you usually get for windowed cases so it's it's really supposed to be a revolutionary product for them i uh i got a look at a prototype of this a couple months ago at their offices and it is beautiful. There's, I don't know if you can see in the, uh, in the, the pictures, there, there's this like, like 
break between the front and rear chambers where you can actually right. see through, which is just sort of there to kind of give mm. you an interesting design cue and also just to indicate, yes, this is really isolated front to back. The shape yeah. is, is understated but different. Um, the materials are premium, so you do have like a, an aluminum case. This is not mm -hmm. plasticky at all. And the tempered glass is beautiful. So I, I don't know, I'd spend 400, 500 bucks on a case, but this is Antec making a statement about them being a premier case maker. And I think what you probably can expect is that this, this design ID sets a tone for what they may do in the next year or two. Uh, with additional mm -hmm. more affordable cases so i i like from that standpoint i like what they're doing it's different it's not the same old box but it's not a, it's a it's a nice version of the stealth fighter inspired <laughs> right. design mode like they, they worked with they, they were they said they worked with an external design studio to make this thing yeah um yeah you know so it it looks i mean it looks really nice i think but um astro studios yeah astro studios yeah, and it, and it looks like a, a pro design ID firm, you know, has I mean, clearly had some involvement. So, yeah. Very interesting. Good time and we'll be getting, we'll be, yeah, we'll be getting one of these for review. So I'm looking forward to getting my hands on it and tearing it apart and seeing what makes it tick. So Sure. Excellent. Thunderbolt 3 pushes 40 gigabytes per second through USB Type-C port. This is kind of the last gasp of any competitor to USB-C, and the I would suggest a uh, just kind of a, a, a an admission that USB-C is it for the future. Would you not say that, Jeff Gager? Yeah, I mean it's it's inevitable. I think everybody wanted a reversible plug, and this kind of piggybacks Thunderbolt on top of USB-C's Type C plug. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is it's a next-gen Thunderbolt chip. Uh, you know, it doubles the speed of Thunderbolt 2, so you can push 40 gigabyte or gigabits per second. It supports USB 3 instead of USB 2, or sorry, PCI Express uh, 3 instead of PCI Express 2. Um, it can also pass uh, USB 3.1 signals, but instead of passing ones that are coming from the host chipset, it actually has a built-in USB 3.1 controller. So Intel is not only sort of admitted that USB 3.0 or USB is one by adopting the connector, but they've actually put a dedicated USB 3.1 controller in their Thunderbolt chip. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's more Thunderbolt, which is kind of, you know, the cache here versus USB 3.1, which is also capable of carrying display signals and power is that here you get PCI Express. So for something like an external graphics module or external peripherals, you do have kind of a, a something that you can do with Thunderbolt that you can't do with with, uh, with USB. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's, it's hard to get terribly interested about this. I'm really hoping that it enables external graphics modules when you've got four Gen 3 PCI Express lanes. You've got plenty of bandwidth, I think, for a graphics card. Um, I think now with a lot of the, the slim notebooks you're seeing, and they've got a lot of you know, power efficient GPUs, the, all the pieces are there for them to do something interesting. And Thunderbolt is, I think, how you'd want to do it. Um, but apart from that, and, and some of the sort of more professional applications where you're dealing with lots of displays and, and lots of really fast external storage, it does seem like kind of a weird fit for, for sort of traditional PCs and laptops where USB Type-C on its own will probably give you a lot of the functionality that you need uh, for stuff like doing display and, and peripherals over a single cable or doing sort of fast charging with up to 100 watts. Um, and funnily enough, Intel has also, or th sort of through Gigabyte, um, we sort of learned that Intel does have a dedicated USB 3.1 controller that's going to be on some of the upcoming Skylake motherboards. So Intel seems to be going all in on, on USB 3.1. And it's not clear if it's the same chip and they've just kind of disabled the Thunderbolt stuff to give USB 3.1 that, that would kind of fit with Intel's MO. Um, but the company does seem to be kind of fully embracing the, the new USB spec. Um, we probably should have updated this, but they did get back to us and say, you know, this is Alpine Trail or whatever it is. So they are putting this chip on their motherboards. Oh, good. So I was, I was going to say, you know, if you don't have, if you make, if you're Intel and you make a USB 3.1 chip that doesn't have Thunderbolt, and you're pushing Thunderbolt? What are you doing? Yeah. Right? I, mean, <laughs> I don't understand. And maybe that's okay if they're just trying to make it die, but why do they even make yeah. the chip at all? 
Well, I mean, what's real, uh, it's what's weird though is like, in, you know, the, again, this is a separate article, but Gigabyte talks about like how it's just USB 3.1 for now and support for Thunderbolt and other things is coming later, which is kind of confusing language. So it's like weird. Like maybe they're, they'll segment this somehow, like disable parts of it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I'm sure Intel will segment this. It'll be yeah. like 50 bucks for the Thunderbolt 3 chip. <laughs> And like ten for the the USB chip, and they'll be the same thing with like some sort of fuse. But, you know, we but, were speculating yeah, but they, that they can't ask for. I guess they can ask for more, but it'd be it'd be it'd be. It'd be I think that'd be disastrous, right? I mean, if if they want Thunderbolt out there, the best way to do it is to sell a USB three point one chip that happens to have that too. Right. Um, and, you've and, got companies like S Media and and Via selling probably cheaper USB three point one chips. So yeah. you've got to have... Yeah, but, you know, ultimately, you they need to put it in their chipset, and they haven't put Thunderbolt in their chipsets, I guess. Yeah. No. They'll make it part of an Ultrabook standard, and notebook makers will have to use it to get whatever, you know, marketing dollars that are part of that package, so... Hey, you know, if if it were to become standard that you had PCI Express connectivity through a, a USB-C cable that would allow, like like, notebooks to have external graphics, then I'd be rooting for Thunderbolt to win. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a really cool idea. Yeah, and and it, there's no downside because it's already going to be compatible with what everybody we know is really going to win the everything else, the USB stuff, right? But right. if if like the Intel components, you know, which is just a big chunk of the laptop market and desktop market, if Intel components have Thunderbolt just as a matter of course, along with the USB Type C, then Thunderbolt matters, and, and if it's still like bifurcated then it won't so i don't know i guess we'll see i want to skip the next story here and talk very quickly about fallout 4 this has been a big deal this week there was a, a teaser page on the website for bethesda and now we have a trailer for a hotly anticipated uh sequel to fallout 3 I never, you know, I take that back. I played fallout 3 for like a hot five minutes and didn't <laughs> really get into it uh, did anyone on this on this panel play it very much? Yes, I played it for like eighty hours. Wow! Anyone yeah. else? <laughs> I failed. I was not that like, I don't love I you, I Catman. I'm just saying fifteen minutes, and I it didn't. Yeah, you and I had the same experience, and I kind of lost interest. I was like, it was like you have two bullets, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> I really yeah. don't. I, I, the, Borderlands, I'd have a lot more. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, I like the idea of an FPS RPG sort of mix-up, but Bethesda, I mean, <clears throat> look at the combat in Skyrim. It is, it is That's a great game with laughably bad combat, right? Which is the same thing as they've been doing in Elder Scrolls. But, you know, in, in the feel of the shooting in Fallout, at least at the start, was pretty poor. And, and I, I was like, no, I, no... There are better yeah. options, right? The, and now rebuttal. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's not really a great. I mean, it's not really. I'm not going to defend its shooting. I think like the engines, the way it handled. It's not really a first person shooter. Like that feels like something that was grudgingly tacked on. Like you can click the mouse button and fire bullets or whatever without going into the like RPG kind of you know turn based thing. Were you but, like, like, yeah, you essentially gamble how much damage your bullet is going to do. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's how it works. That's how the first-person shooting works. It still uses that system. It's not like just press button, bullet goes and hits things. It is it is still probability-based. But I, I Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Do you mean that a first-person shooting, shooting engine is doing probability behind the scenes and Fallout 3 just created a dynamic wherein you see the percentages associated with a particular body part of your opponent, how much damage it might potentially do, and therefore it's the same mechanic, it's just turn by turn? Yes, maybe. Hmm. I don't know how that works. Yeah, it wasn't very fun. Um, <laughs> well, I disagree. But, oh, but a lot of people no, love I, that I, you know, game. To be fair, a lot of people sunk a ton of time into this. Yeah. And I, I can respect that it it was it was someone's cup of tea. And obviously people are very excited about Fallout 4. I think, Scott, you and I are, when it comes to apocalyptic, you know, shooters, I think Borderlands is where my heart lies. But, um, yeah, my, you know. But uh, did you play New Vegas too, Jeff? Yes. I, I, I bought it. I finished it. I was not so impressed with New Vegas. I think, like, um, 
the this just the way like the quest system worked and the missions worked out were just they were not well handled. I think they tried to do too much and it all sort of just collided together in a very unrefined, janky sort of feeling way. But hmm. I still I still sunk a lot of time into it. I was still yeah, like Hmm? I just want to do the game justice. Explain to me why Fallout 3, besides abysmal combat, why, why is the series regarded, and in, 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 not that I, I'm not aware of its, its, its fame, just why did you enjoy it? Why did you sink so much time into it? I mean, I, I have a soft spot for, like, post-nuclear apocalypse landscapes. And, like, I think the characters, like, the characters and the backstories of the characters are pretty compelling. You know, so it's a great, I think it's a great story. Um, okay. that's what mostly kept me playing. So, right. and once, once you get the feel of the turn-based combat, it's not quite, I mean, it's, it, it's fine. I think like, that's how the game is meant to be played. That's how it wants you to play it. If you can get along with that, then. I think hey. it's worth noting that, I mean, I, I would say it is up there with, um, Oh my goodness! What, uh, what is the name of the game? I can see the the cover. My uh, underwater action adventure. Bioshock. Bioshock. It's up there with Bioshock in the sense of having a cult following, cosplay, people making their own Pit Boy, people making sure. all the armor. You know, so I, I I know it's got that cultural sort of gaming penetration that is substantial. So I don't want to discredit that. Uh, but uh, yeah, people are excited about Fallout Four, uh, and you know, I'm I'm. You know, now, see, I didn't like. I did not like Bioshock at all. Oh, I thought that was a subpar. Game. I didn't mean to compare the two. I just meant they sure. both are sort of bizarro and both have a very passionate following. Sure. So, but okay. yeah, I'm looking forward to Fallout Four. I, I want to see what they do with it. So. Yeah, and there is something I will. It would admit um, there is something very well. We could talk about Mad Max. We don't have the time, but there is something <laughs> sort of visually and psychologically intriguing about a post end of the world everything has gone to hell and now you have to make the most of what's left story i don't know why humans are so fascinated by that um i don't know why but we really like that stuff i mean i think borderlands is a different version of that borderlands is like that in space but i love that now, yeah, see, i haven't I, played borderlands so maybe i would really enjoy borderlands too so just the idea that everything kind of isn't uh, is is kind of gone to hell, and there's no order in society, and you kind of have to make your way through things, uh, you know, with force. That's a great setting for a game, right? Yeah, um, I think it's the it's the fantasy that everyone else is a, is a, is a disadvantaged and a victim, but you get to be the one who can kick anyone's ass. There's a lot, yeah. There's a lot going on there. Um, with that but you know that's it's it's one of those things i think is very elemental like like early human existence kind of thing right to to like be man against nature and man against man uh in a way that you don't really have uh living in the city today <laughs> so, right right yeah. well and also there's also a little bit of that um uh, that steampunk in the case of fallout the sort of 1960s never quite ended uh, alternate universe that I think people also get excited about, um, you know, That's teal cool. toasters and and long cars. Um, so do we want to yeah. answer some uh, some chat questions? Well, we've got we've got two of them that are queued up here, so we should probably do at least one of the ones from Ninjitsu, the first one. Yeah, let's um, do the first and one. The, and then we can, we'll take if you're in the chat and you have other questions, drop them in there now, and we'll try and answer. So. Ninjitsu says, what on earth is Granada? What is Fury? What is Fiji? Which one is supposed to be the 390X? So this is the, these are related to the upcoming new Radeons, Jordan. Fiji is the code name of the new big chip that is going to be powering the new high-end Radeon. And I already wrote about the, uh, I already wrote about the HPM stuff that they're putting on there. That's, that's, Fiji is the first chip to implement that that capability right um so so fiji is the first is basically a piece of silicon um so we know about that fury is the rumored name of the new radeon that would compete with the titan the geforce titan x right so mm -hmm. you have the geforce titan they're saying the radeon fury is the uh is, is the like 
probably really expensive ultra high end card that they're they're rumored to be coming out with um which harkens back to the early days of ati rage graphics card that i think they had a rage fury that was a rage fury max that sounds was vaguely familiar yeah fury. yeah and and so this is this is potentially a, a new brand that's an old brand that they're bringing back um grenada is rumored to be a uh part of like a gpu that's also part of the new radeon lineup and we already have a story we already have a story about this we know that amd has already released to pc makers sort of oem versions of the new radeon r x r9 r7 whatever three 300 series and and they um have done a lot of rebranding of existing gpus and the highest end ones that they've so far uh, given information on are the R9 380X, I think is, is a Tonga based. So it's like the R9 285 or no, not 380X, just 380. It's a 256 bit Tonga based thing that it's basically just a rebranded Radeon R9 285. Um, Grenada is probably a new code name for an old chip. Uh, and the rumor is it's a codename for the, the Hawaii chip that now drives the Radeon R9 290 and 290X. And then when they do the rebrand on those to what might be 390, 390X, we don't really know, that um, they will uh, call those things Grenada. Um, mm. I have some questions about how this all fits together because uh, Hawaii is a big chip with a wide memory bus and um i guess they could keep selling it um it's probably going to be a lot slower than if if they succeed with with fiji fiji should be a lot more a lot higher performance because of the high bandwidth memory and uh, probably just a lot more of everything in terms of resources on the chip um so it's possible that the new lineup includes a, a re branded Hawaii and th they do things like they kind of did with the Radeon HD 7970 where they did the gigahertz edition. They could do this with the R9 uh, 290, 290X where they do higher end ones and they call that chip Grenada. They actually did this some on some of their rebranding. I think they give Pit Karen a new name and it's weird because basically what AMD has been doing uh, for a long time is dragging out things instead of releasing a new the whole new slate of GPUs. And that's clearly what they're doing here. They're still shipping, like Pitcairn is one of the new R9 300 series uh, cards is based on this Pitcairn chip that is from like late 2011 or early 2011. Was it, was it the, the 7970 came out when? Um, but but uh, yeah, I mean, we're talking, let's see, the 7970 came out. Jan my yeah it was late 2011 my review uh was then in, in january 2012 i was a little late with it so we're talking about some old chips that they keep bringing forward and as they do that they've added new names so i don't know what the mix is going to be on all this stuff i do know that um i think we have confirmation about something that we talked about before which is the r9 285 is based on a tonga chip that's got 256 bit memory interface and we expected a 285X and never got it. Now the R9 380 is based on the same thing. I continue to expect a 380X and we might even get some other like higher end branding from that. Cause I think we have confirmation that Tonga has a 384 bit memory interface. Um, hmm. And the weird thing about that to me is I think that Tonga with a 384 bit interface and enough juice could be f as fast as like R9 290 or maybe even a 290X, um, but it's a smaller chip. So I don't know if they keep shipping Hawaii-based stuff like this rumor says with this whole Grenada thing, or if we just have Tonga-based stuff that goes like up pretty high on their stack and then they, the rest of them are Fiji-based. Um, so all of this stuff is interesting because everybody's excited because Jordan, we're like not far from we're like less than two weeks from AMD is going to have an event uh, in LA. Oh, yeah. I will be there and they're going to announce their new products. And we kind of know it's going to be Fiji. Um, so it's right before E3 starts or right at the beginning of E3. Mm. And uh, I think my expectation is that they'll announce the product and then sometime after that, they'll start shipping and hopefully we'll have a review. Uh, I, I mean, this isn't the first time that they've done. They always do kind of a, a pre E3 event, don't they? Uh, E3. Uh, 
I feel like they've done that before. No, when they launched Hawaii, they did their own thing in Hawaii, and they did a web based stream of this event and then we took the cards home and reviewed them um i think this is the same playbook but around e3 i'm sure they have involvement with e3 but as far as no, i, I know, just have vague remember of them like doing like an off off show event prior to the the actual convention i don't know they they may have in the past i didn't go to any of them so i, mm, I don't have okay. a strong memory of that so all right, let's move forward real fast here. Uh, this is a big deal and just something we want to spend some time on. A new Titan card from NVIDIA, the GeForce GTX 980 Ti. Scott, you published this review uh, at the time of this recording. It looks like on Sunday of this week. And uh, this is this is a monster. Um, yeah, and you know, Jordan, we have a, we've, we've talked about a lot of stuff on the show. We have a lot of more stuff to talk about um so i'm gonna make this quick and really it only deserves that it, it's an interesting card because uh it's 650 dollars and it's based on the same gm200 chip as the titan x we know the titan x is the highest performance gpu on the market and right. the deal with this is it's a slightly cut down titan x but it's been tweaked and tuned a little bit so that it, even though the clock speeds are the same as the titan x it actually operates at slightly higher clock speeds and basically gains back whatever it loses from a, a few units being disabled on the titan x and so the end result is that the performance of the thing is extremely close to the titan x but instead of being a thousand dollars it's 650. and then they they reduce the price of the geforce gtx 980 to 500 dollars from 550 to kind of make room for this and the the 980 tie uh, comes with a copy of Arkham Knight, so you get a nice a, a free game to go with it. And this Sweet. is NVIDIA. It's got it's played its cards, literally cards, right? Um, before Fiji comes out, <laughs> so um, so that's the deal. And, and you know, I tested it against the R9 Radeon R9 290X and then the dual GPU R9 285. Um, and really, you need two of the Hawaii chips to match one GM200. And in the FPS averages, clearly the, the dual GPU Radeon R9285 is faster than the GTX 980 Ti, even though they cost about the same. But you look at the 99th percentile frame times, which is our way of quantifying the gaming experience more accurately according to the individual frame times, and the, the GTX 980 Ti beats the R9 285X2. Um, and, you know, you, then you look at the, the power consumption and the 295X2 based system, like our test rig with that card in it, is over twice the power consumption of the 980 Ti, a test system with the 980 Ti in it. So uh, clearly, uh, like in, this is, the, the 285, or 295X2 is really kind of overmatched. Um, uh, you know, th this is two of AMD's last gen GPUs and um, they, they, you know, they, they kind of match up with the 980 Ti in performance, but they, they need more than twice the power to do it. Um, obviously, the real competition for this is whatever Radeon Fury or whatever R9390X or whatever it is that AMD calls the new thing. Um, and we're going to get that soon. So for now, this is... Uh, the winner in the market as the the best single GPU graphics card you can buy, um, and I think we're probably going to have a look at some of the uh, custom versions with custom coolers and higher clocks and things like that, which could be interesting. But the real question is how does it match up to the new Radeon? And to answer that, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer uh, until the new Radeon hits the market. Interesting. So we have a question from the readership. Scott, you have two 970s in SLI now. How do you feel about them now that you reviewed the new 980 Ti? Have you gotten much use out of them in your spare time? Any chance you might add 970 SLI to your reviews? Or... Um, no. <laughs> I totally should add that to the review. I totally haven't had time to do it. Maybe I can do it in the context of there's more high-end GPU stuff coming. I would love to answer the question of what, is, what do two GTX 970s and SLI look like for high-end stuff? I think that's it. that's like price-wise, there's a lot of power for the money there. And 
I think NVIDIA has done a better job with SLI drivers than AMD has with, with Crossfire. But I got to test to verify that and uh, haven't yet. Um, if I were buying new, I probably would go, would go with the 980 Ti over two 970s uh, just on principle. But having two 970s for the price is not a bad place to be um, right now. So I hope to answer that with some data, but I don't have it yet. Sorry, guys. What else is there to say here? Or should we move on about the 980? No, we should definitely move on because there's a ton more to talk about. Excellent. NVIDIA's G-Sync goes mobile, adds features, variable refresh, comes to laptops and windowed games. Yeah, so um, basically now you can buy GeForce Space laptops and they put G-Sync in them. And mm -hmm. they don't need a module to do it like they do on the desktop because in laptops you don't have a scalar chip uh, in between the GPU and the LCD drive uh, controller. So basically you can just <clears throat> sort of have the GPU drive the, the display and uh, you, you don't need the extra logic. So the, it's actually, it saves power to have variable refresh in a laptop in certain cases, not gaming, but, but just desktop use, it can save power. And, um, they have done a nice job of basically the, most of these laptop displays looks like the, the standard is going to be 75 Hertz refresh. Um, in a laptop, which is nice. And uh, it has all the features and behaviors from G-Sync, including the way that handles low FPS scenarios to avoid collisions and the, the overdrive, custom overdrive per panel to prevent ghosting and all the things that we kind of talked about in the context of G-Sync versus FreeSync and all of that recently. So um, there, are, there are a bunch of laptops that, that were uh, sort of, Nvidia talked about them and a lot of them were announced at Computex this week. And I, I'm hoping to get my hands on one or two of them soon. Uh, most of them are gaming laptops. They're 15 or 17 inch big things, but um, you know, it makes sense to do this. And Nvidia is saying basically going forward, if you have a laptop with a GeForce in it, then we want it to have G-Sync, um, which is is a nice thing. They, they don't you don't have to add any hardware to do it. They just have to work with the the laptop maker, make sure the panel is in there. Uh, you know, get the right overdrive settings for that panel and tune it, and um, they're good to go. So that's a that's a thing that's happening. Uh, that is that that makes sense, and I'm hoping that we'll get a look at one of them. I did actually play Jordan with a uh, prototype a couple weeks ago. I got a look at this during a briefing, and it looks like G-Sync. It looks like it's smooth, and it looks like FreeSync too, actually, because <laughs> they're mm. pretty much the same thing. But it looks like a variable refresh display, and you can play games, and it, it feels smoother. So I I now want this on any gaming system that I use, and so I'd want it on a gaming laptop. Um, they also talked about a bunch of new desktop displays with uh, G-Sync coming, and... Um, I don't know, guys, which ones look the most interesting to you? Uh, there's this Acer that's a 34 inch panel. It's curved, has a 3400 by 1400 something uh, resolution, 75 Hertz peak refresh and it's IPS. So three of those playing project cars. That'd be yeah. sweet. <clears throat> Back me up. Yeah, so th that, that would be cheap, but but, well, it also goes to 75. It's not like the the 60 hertz displays that have that as a peak. So it gives you a little bit more. It's not quite the 120 or the 124 or 144, but you can sort of go up a little bit higher, which I like. Yeah, and, you know, 60 hertz with variable refresh isn't terrible. It's actually a better experience. Actually, you kind of need it more with the, the 60 hertz peak refresh than you do at 144 or whatever. You need variability, that is. But 75 is a nice place to be, you know. Um, the other thing is, uh, let's see, this PG279Q from Asus looks like to be uh, a really nice gaming display. 27-inch, 2560 by 1440, 144 its refresh with IPS. So it's yeah. the G-Sync panel to have. But you know what I've got right over here, the Acer XB270HU, which is the same thing, but it's already out in the market. Um, Asus does a nice job. They may have better stuff overall, but I haven't found a weakness in this Acer. I'm hoping to have a review out soon. So, um, 
the good thing about that though is if, if we have more than one of those things on the market then we might get some price competition <laughs> or one of them in stock consistently <laughs> yeah, is the is the xp 270 hu hard to find i haven't i don't know i don't oh. i know the, the rog swift has been oh well geez yeah that they just basically didn't bring enough of those to north america didn't make enough so but there there are a bunch of these and i think most of them we did hear from some of these uh from acer and asus about some of these i think this week during computex but there are a bunch of new g-sync displays coming and of course no they don't support free sync and no uh you know that there's been no change nvidia is continuing with not supporting the other standard and only doing their own thing. So that there's no new news on that front. Um, there are some nice 4K panels in the list too, but I think we should go on and talk about the other thing they did, which was um, they added a few more control panel options, including you can turn V-Sync on and off. So, so basically with V-Sync off, you still get G-Sync variable refresh with synchronization up to the peak panel refresh rate and you go above that and it will tear so that the game loop can run faster than the display is capable so that you get like <clears throat> the additional goodness of the game loop running faster which twitch gamers might want um i don't because i want the synchronization usually but for testing purposes is actually nice for me because i can play variable refresh and get valid benchmark results um the other thing is uh windowed mode gaming which is a huge thing for streamers hmm. and just people who a lot of people don't like to, being focused yeah they want a game in a window and, and the issue here is that the windows desktop is its own application with a fixed refresh rate how do you make g-sync variable refresh work in conjunction with that and what nvidia wound up doing is kind of going around behind microsoft's back and making the refresh rate of the windows desktop match the refresh rate of the in focus to application and if that application is the game then you get variable refresh for the game on the desktop and so it seems to work and um this is a new driver that they've they've actually released these drivers with this feature and so any g-sync uh display with any compatible nvidia geforce graphics card now has windowed mode including borderless windowed mode which is really popular Again, for I think for streaming and stuff where you want to be able to to switch away or have multiple monitors and, and move back and forth. So um, that's nice. And uh, they're also adding support explicitly in the control panel for ultra low motion blur, which is a, a, a strobing of the backlight that is not part of variable refresh. But some of these gaming displays do the G-Sync panel supports it. And um, now you can kind of turn that on with software instead of having to go through the the uh menus on your monitor which is kind of a a pain in the rear so um that's a neat option i prefer variable refresh to ulmb generally but ulmb is is actually the type of thing that they use the low persistence mode in the oculus rift is basically that so that you you get rid of motion blur when you're moving your head around um and i think it's going to be an important thing going forward uh, at least in not not the, if not on the desktop then uh in, in other types of displays and it's a fun thing to play with and so they've just added support for that to the the drivers so that's pretty much just the update it's kind of like nvidia is adding additional goodness to g-sync and and it's some of it's the software some of it's the displays and some of it's just bringing it to laptops exciting right. stuff Want to talk Intel's Broadwell? Uh, I think we should. It's... Intel's Intel's Broadwell goes broad with new desktop mobile slash server variants, 14 nanometer chips. So uh, what's going on here, Scott? Um, well, we we kind of known about this for a while. Um, there there's socketed desk. There are two socketed desktop chips that they they announced that are that will go into like existing Z97 motherboards, but they're based on the new Broadwell architecture and the new 14 nanometer uh, fabrication process. These are kind of weird because they're unlocked, they're overclockable, um, and yet the clock speeds aren't as high as the existing Haswell parts. And they have a 65 watt power envelope instead of a higher one um, where they could get to the higher clocks. Um, 
and they have Iris Pro graphics, which Jordan Iris Pro is like the fastest Intel just, or integrated graphics plus 128 megs of ED RAM on the package with the chip uh, that basically acts as a graphics cache. Since you mm -hmm. don't have, you have limited bandwidth going into the CPU socket, the way you get around that for graphics is you put on a separate ED RAM cache with more bandwidth. And so these things are kind of strange because if you're a PC gamer who likes to overclock and you want to unlock processor and get the fastest thing, you still want like a Core i7-4790K. But this gives you the ability to play around with something that has that that ed ram actually acts as a l4 cache for the whole cpu so it's like a 128 meg l4 cache the latest intel architecture fully unlocked the latest 14 nanometer process from intel um and so it's maybe the best thing that goes into z97 socket except not really because the Haswell stuff is out there. And I think this is just an artifact of two things. One is the 14 nanometer process that Intel built really is tuned for low voltage operation, really FinFETs, which is the, the Trigate transistors they've done the last two generations, have their biggest benefits at low voltage. Higher switching speeds uh, and higher clock speeds, therefore, are not the biggest strength of that at the, the peak end of the sort of voltage range. And so, you don't actually get a lot of benefits on the desktop from 14 nanometers, at least not with this chip. Um, and, and so there's a sort of a weird artifact there. The other side of it is, you know, Intel wanted to, and I think to their credit, give uh, gamers and enthusiasts access to what is in many ways some of their best technology, including the ED RAM cache and the best graphics that they offer and, and the 14 nanometer stuff and let them see what they can do with the clock speeds. So these chips, the Core i7-5775C, it's like 366 bucks and the 5675C is 276 bucks. They're not super cheap um, and, and their, their base and peak clocks are in the mid three gigahertz range or low, low base, mid three gigahertz peak clocks. Um, they're not the fastest things out there, but they're just, they're kind of unique. So we're going to get them. I'm going to play with them and see what we can do with the overclocking um, and kind of go from there. The thing is, the next generation architecture from Intel Skylake is expected really this year still. Um, and so we may have Broadwell getting supplanted by Skylake and new 100 series chipsets and motherboards and the whole thing very soon. Um, so Intel's kind of rushing this thing out there. That's a little weird, uh, to give us on the desktop, the newest stuff. And then that probably gets pushed aside when Skylight comes out. Um, they also did, uh, uh, mobile versions. These are all 47 Watts. They're for like those luggable laptops. Like we were looking at with the G forces, uh, in them, uh, you know, the 15 inch, 17 inch big things or all in one systems and things like that. Um, and then they did a Xeon version for like Jordan, I think it's for like, uh, say your YouTube and you want, uh, to have a bunch of video transcoding capability in a rack server rack. The Xeon has the quick sync stuff that, that they built into these CPUs to encode video or transcode video actually. Um, and, and they'll sell it to you as a, a data center processor in hmm. that form. It's all the same quad core die, uh, you know, with hyper threading, you get eight threads, uh, and you know, this, the, the ED RAM for, for the, uh, I don't, know, I don't know if the, Zen, the Xeon has ED RAM, but, but the capability to add ED RAM and then higher end integrated graphics. So it's all the same. I think it's all the one chip, but it's sort of a higher, higher end quad core. Whereas most of the Broadwell stuff today has been two cores, four threads, lower power. And so that's, that's that. Um, and we have a, a reader question here, Jordan, I think about this one. Um, yeah. The question is here from Chukula. Is that count Chuckula or just Chuckula? Okay, nice and simple. You can even answer it here before the show. Did Intel get off its keister and ship you review samples of the i5, excuse me, i7 5775C and the 5675C? If not, who do we smack at Intel to get them to do their jobs? 
So Intel has launched this product. They launched it at Computex, and they, the PR people reached out to us before the show, and they said, uh, the PR rep said, we are not shipping review units until after the show. The show is not actually ended as we record this, so we do not have uh, a, ship, a chip yet in hand. Uh, however, uh, during the show, two publications owned by the same corporate entity, Perch, reviewed this these processor, the desktop chips, um, a non-tech and Tom's hardware guide, both of which are owned by the same company. Um, and I've had people who are fellow journalists, analysts who like to read our reviews, readers, people in the industry, people who work at Intel asking me the question, why did you not have one so you could do a good review? And, and the answer to that question <laughs> is that uh, Intel, in its wisdom, saw fit to work with one corporate entity that has two big websites and not to work with us on this. Um, if you want them to change, that's sort of another question. How do we fix this? Uh, honestly, I don't know the answer entirely. Um, I, I think that the best thing that could happen from my point of view is this. Intel is a bad partner to work with if they're going to send our large corporate competitors a product before they send it to us. Um, so we shouldn't be waiting. To, to work with their PR for seeding of this product. If you're in the industry and you have access to these chips and you uh, can share one with us on loan before Intel's product launch, we're happy to take it in confidentially to not reveal the source of the chip or any specific information, test it and get a world exclusive on it and re return it back to you uh, in a very short time window. So uh, there's no reason why we need to wait for Intel if they're not going to work with us to uh, make sure that we have the same chance as everybody else to get a review published uh, on schedule. So that's that's one way. If you have uh, you know the, the the means in the industry, you're listening. Feel free to contact me. Um, you know I'm all over the website, and, and we can next time they do a product launch, maybe months before. I don't know. The, the samples are out there, and uh, you know there's no there's no disadvantage for us in getting a hold of uh, early sample if and the only thing that the only consequence is going to be Intel saying well you're not going to get a review unit like so what if we wait for Intel um, we're not going to get a review unit until after our, our corporate competitors so um, that's my that's my best answer for you guys um, and, and you know I don't know what to tell you we've worked with Intel for 15 years and um, you know they they seem to want to change uh, now to a different MO where, where they work tightly with big corporate media uh, and, and privilege them over the small guys. Yeah, that's really frustrating. Yeah. A pox on them, I say. Or, or not. I don't know. What, no? Okay. Uh, let's talk really fast. Uh, well, we have two options. We can either talk about the uh, master click baiting that we've been doing or we can talk about uh, AMD's Carrizo. Um, we, we definitely need to address the clickbait issue. Um, so, yeah. so this week, so for this those week on the it. site, I think we yeah, have a list of the it. headlines for Computex. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these. Um, okay. And I'm going to read these, I think, in the tone in which they are written, if you'll, if you'll, if you'll allow me. Um, these are some of the headlines from some of the news stories that were posted on the Tech Report in the past week. Uh, let's go through these one at a time here. There are 256 reasons you'll love this LED fan. Number 42 is the best. Four webcams, one overlay. What happens next will shock you. You'll never guess which bard is returning with a new tail. Switch hitting USB drive mates with both types. Miracle Diet shrinks Skylake Mobo to a size mini ITX. Mechanized EATX Tower terrorizes Computex. We reveal Bethsaida's secret. You won't believe the fallout from this. Graphics cards makers hate this one. Oh, my, I hate these the most. <laughs> <laughs> Graphics cards makers hate this one weird trick. Doctors hate her for finding out this secret to weight loss. CVS is a run with the new protein patch. Um... Watch this astonishing! Watch this astonishing! Watch this astonishing thermal footage of Cryorg's hybrid CPU cooler. I'm losing steam here. 16.7 billion reasons Altera sold out to Intel. I'll give you a hint: those billion reasons each have a dollar cent next to them. You know what I'm saying? Nvidia released the GTX 980 Ti. You won't believe what Gigabyte did next. 
it's carnage, man. That's all. Yeah, that's it's a, terrible. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's really bad. I feel like I just read off like the the BuzzFeed weekly agenda. I I woke up one morning this week and said. I'm just doing clickbait headlines today. I mean, I, I don't. And then all of a sudden, it, was like, <laughs> it became a thing. And, and we started doing it because what the heck? It was, it was a way to make things fun. But, you know, Jordan. Oh, but, oh, but, but Scott, there's no such thing as fun. Well, you can have fun. You know, Jordan, we, we serve an audience of nerds. And, and Shh, I have to tell you that nerds can be pretty right literal now. people. And, and I mean, I love our audience. We're nerds. Come on. But but there are a lot of them who just really I got some angry emails about this. And Jordan, you won't believe what happened next. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I, 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 I guess we should take this moment in the show to reassure people that this is not the new normal for the tech report going forward. It was yeah. a joke. Um, we were just having fun with the formula that that has gone has gone over the web, and honestly, the writing challenge about how many USB ports on a motherboard for Computex is not always all that entertaining. So we were trying to have some fun. And uh, Company X releases Thing Y, repeat yeah. twenty times throughout the week. So, let me let me just let me just I'm just gonna I just got this I can't help myself. Hold on a second. This is this is a website that's run by a friend of mine, and I love this friend dearly. But this is literally the headlines from their site. I'm just going to read this out because we're not kidding. This is a news website. Um, nobody thought twice about these piss Pittsburgh bus ads until one woman noticed the message they spell backward. <laughs> Walmart's number one selling item isn't at all what you'd expect. Here's a good one. Watch closely to see the awesome way Marcus Luttrell reacts when he's called a hero during Rick Perry's speech. The Christian denomination that American people are most skeptical about. It's bad. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Well, now I, I think that there were too many people who actually who saw our headlines and thought, oh, no, like the tech oh, no, report is, is becoming that, you know, like. like yeah, they're like, becoming they're becoming one more here for the road. Man noticed something utterly disgusting in his drink after poor service at Chili's <laughs> that had police getting involved. <laughs> You know what it is? Don't we need? This... We need to have a Florida man headline. That's, that's <laughs> oh, that's uh, true. Hold yes. on, let me, do, let me do a word search. There's got to be at least one on every on every. Oh no, no. Do Florida. we know hold any on. Florida men? Maybe. Well, you can just make well, that. Some you can... companies based out of Florida. I know some of the the boutique PC builders are based out of there. So. Surely, like there's some like famous overclocker or game streamer <laughs> or something that we could write a story about. But... How about how about yeah? Uh, no, I, I can't make it up. up. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty bad. It's called clickbaiting. And, and you know the problem with clickbaiting is that – and you guys were doing it in jest, but I'm just making this as a side observation. Clickbaiting is like flypaper for busy buddies on the internet. Whenever you have a sensationalist headline, which is usually accompanied by sensationalist stories, it is always accompanied by sensationalist commenters. And they're really just the icing on that crap cake. They really are. <laughs> because it'll be like, here's this political headline that makes you think something really bad is happening in this country. Here's the story that proves it. And then the comments, yep, Obama, you screwed it up. It's the world we live in now. I'm digging a hole in my backyard. <laughs> I'm moving to Florida. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're leaving tonight. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we did that this week. We, we promise we'll never do it again. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. don't make that promise. I'm sorry. We uh, yeah. promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase. No, no, no. Re we reserve that. the right to do this again. We promise we will never do it again sober. So that's, you know. <laughs> there might be a, there might be a flask situation in which Scott is like I just can't help it anymore. Um, okay, do we want to talk Carrizo and then call it a show? Yeah, look, we should probably talk Carrizo. I, I think that I spent a bunch. Of time Scott Watson's here to talk Carrizo, and what he says about laptops will shock you. 
AMD used one weird trick to reduce power <laughs> consumption oh, during 1080p oh, video so playback. <laughs> my favorite is my favorite is doctors hate her for this discovery. That's the one that's just. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Like Carizzo is basically AMD's answer to Broadwell Jordan, but the the 15 watt like laptop version. Um, so this is their next APU that comes after Kaveri, and um, they have really focused on getting this into 15 watt power envelope. I actually did an article about this a couple weeks ago. We talked about a bunch of circuit design techniques and optimizations that they did for power. Um, now at Computex, they actually launched the product, and this is this is basically like we know the exact specs. It's a quad core APU. It has basically the same uh, graphics config as the last one, but it has the newer Tonga style uh, graphics that does. Uh, delta based color compression so it's more efficient with this memory bandwidth and therefore you get faster graphics but the the key to everything really on this is that their most optimal operating point for having all the graphics units enabled uh for having you know good cpu performance with with the new excavator uh core which is a, a another follow on to bulldozer it's the latest generation of, of their their x86 compatible cpu core the, the key to everything is that, that these all work best at uh 15 watts in, in a, a laptop style uh power envelope so they cut the size of the l2 cache from 2 meg to 1 meg per per module and doubled the l1 data cache that was a better trade-off uh then they optimized that cache to be lower power um they they got some nice improvements uh, per clock over uh, the the last generation, even though you know clock speeds might be a little higher. Actually, they are higher at 15 watts, but not much higher. Maybe even a little lower at 35 um, than the last generation. The combination of per clock performance and frequency is up, and in the case of 15 watts, up quite a bit uh, compared to Kaveri. Um, so. The, the the combination of all these things plus actually they have a really nice video codec that does h.265 hevc and uh has the bandwidth now quad quad bandwidth compared to the last generation so it can do 4k uh decoding at low power um so the combination of all those things just gives them a a pretty reasonable uh case for being a competitor to Broadwell, an alternative to Broadwell. Um, and, you know, Jordan Broadwell is in tons of stuff, uh, you know, the Surface Pro and, and a lot of really nice systems. Um, what Intel, or sorry, what AMD is doing here to compete with Intel is they're really targeting $400 to $700 mainstream laptops. Um, these are not mostly uh, like ultra thin. They're thin because even mainstream laptops these days usually aren't that thick but they're not the super thin they're not the surfaces they're not the, the convertible tablets for the most part they're just sort of the things that you know the hps of the world sell boatloads of um that are relatively affordable um and that's what amd is going for with carizzo um that's kind of what is left to them by intel and uh they're hoping that they can sort of make some hay in the back to school season and with you know with windows 10 coming and all that with new systems based on this chip uh in the market at that time and so the hope is that late june the that you see the first ones early july some after that and then into back to school um they'll also have carizzo they have they have options up to 35 watts they'll also have carizzo and things like uh small form factor systems all in ones the the you know like imac style you know types of systems with the the monitor has integrated pc components they'll also sell them into that but there won't be a socketed desktop version of this thing um so you know it has the potential i think to be interesting what we need is we need to get our hands on a, a device based on it that's well tuned for 15 watts and see if it's compelling uh, see if it has good performance see if the uh, combination of cpu and graphics that it has allows you to like have more compelling gaming capability than what you can get with intel it's tough because in these power budgets 35 watts and less uh it's hard to get great performance and um i don't know whether 
if in, if AMD has a better like graphics story in that space, if that works out to like something tangible that you can do gaming wise that you couldn't with an Intel or not. And so that's sort of one of those questions that we'll have to look at once we get our hands on a system. But, you know, they're, they continue to, to fight and this is, uh, them sort of, uh, you know, taking it to uh, a specific part of the market with, with targeted optimizations, um, and giving up, unfortunately, uh, you know, sort of the, the higher end desktops and stuff like that, or even mid range desktops, um, in order to get there. So the hope is that they've been able to be more compelling in this space by, uh, tuning specifically for it. So we'll see. Uh, I hope to get my hands on a laptop before too terribly long. And, uh, then we'll have sort of a better answer, you know, to how good it is. Excellent. All right, folks. I think that brings us to the end of this lovely episode. It's been a while since I've been on the show, so it's good to be back. It's good to be with you all. Good to have you, Jordan. Oh, thanks, man. Indeed. Was that Campman or Gager? Who said that? Campman. Okay, Gager. Was it nice to have you back or? Yeah, Don't answer yeah. that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm teasing. It's nice to have all the pressure of being the pretty one taken off when you're Oh, uh, that's <laughs> it. That's it. It's good. No, no, it's true. It's true. Now, I see you've changed. Have you have you just shit 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 sh ugh. Have you shifted from the full Kroger to just like the uh what is this I've one just here? I've been slightly less lazy about it. To the Toby this is this the Toby Mac that you're doing now? I'll let you guys know. Uh, this is one. the little bit that I need to have something to fiddle with, is what I call it. Nice. You just gotta, you gotta really grow <laughs> it out, and make it long and all right, folks. Um, you can email us, jdrake at techreport.com. Uh, I can't promise the questions will always be answered on the show. Um, there may be some deleting that happens ac ac accidentally. No. Uh, but we do our best to answer what questions we can. You can always Oh, Floto says this is the best podcast yet. It's really nice of you, dude. You know, you're at one, you're like one letter, no, you're like two letters off from Frodo, which would be a lot cooler. Floto works. Anyway, um, or is it Fluto? That'd be interesting. It's Fluto, apparently. Fluto, as in one Fluto over the cuckoo's nest. Uh, that <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Twitch.tv slash Detective Force, where you can watch us live on the next round. We'll get this audio up as soon as we can, and you can check out everything you need to know at thetechreport.com. For the rest of the team at the Tech Report for the Tech Report podcast, so long.